Damn, damn, goddamn. Texas Chainsaw. Because for whatever reason, they got rid of the massacre. Who knows why? This movie was promoted as Texas Chainsaw 3D because it was released in 3D. And oh, it was so worth it. It ignores the previous sequels and it's supposed to be a direct sequel to the original. Even though technically we've already had a sequel to the original by Toby Hooper, no less. You know, the guy who made the original. And even though I don't care for that sequel, it's still the sequel that he wanted to make. But so many years later, you could argue that, hey, since I didn't like that sequel, doing a true sequel, one that's set immediately after the, the original film, that's that should be appealing to me. And it was! Believe me, when this movie was announced and they said it was going to be a true sequel, I loved it. I was excited for it. I couldn't wait to see just what they would do. And then I started to hear that a lot of the original actors from the original film were coming back and this would pick up right after. When I saw the film in the theaters, the opening credits, you hear the dialogue and the sounds from the ending of the original movie. Like you just, you can't get any better than what I thought I was going to get. After that, you see that the Sawyer family are inside their house. We see Gunnar Hansen, who played Leatherface in the original. You see Marilyn Burns, who played Sally in the original. It's kind of weird to see her as a member of the Sawyer family. And then you see Bill Mosley, who was in the second movie. So it was cool to see him in this movie, even though this film says the second movie didn't exist. But I guess his character still exists. The mayor of the town leads a bunch of people from the city. Like, they, they're they sick of this, right? They're sick of the fact that this family has been killing off their people, people that they know, maybe even members of their own family. They're sick of them getting away with murder, so they all show up at the house, and a huge thing breaks out, and they burn the house down, and they kill the entire family, what the fuck, <laughs> they made this big announcement, this big deal, this big stink over the, the idea that we're gonna bring back these actors, bring back these characters, you see a shot of Leatherface, in his costume and his outfit that he wore at the end of the first film. And you think, wow, like this is authentic. We're going to have a story that picks up right after and is the continuation of maybe the same day, same night. But no, they kill everyone off in a way that just screams, we don't know what to do. <laughs> and oh yeah, you know all you fans of the original? We're just going to piss on your grave. And this this was annoying. Very, very annoying. This guy finds this baby who made it outside of the house. The mother's right there. He kills the mother. He takes the baby. And he raises it as his own with his wife. Which sounds messed up. And I guess in some ways it is messed up. But at the same time, he's not blaming the baby for the fucked up family that it comes from. So you're going to give this baby... A new start, a fresh start to start over, and it they, they change the baby's name, and then you see decades later, Heather, who was the baby, now grown up, she's played by Alexandra Daddario. She finds out that she's adopted. Uh, she gets a letter from her grandmother, which is kind of con confusing because if she got her name changed. If she was taken, probably illegally, if you think about how they got the baby, uh, like you assume that there was some shenanigans pulled, maybe with the mayor, giving him a favor. And so none of this really makes sense that the grandmother would know where to find 
her and send her this letter. But it's a movie, so I'm not supposed to think about that. You see the scene of Heather working at a meat section in a, in a grocery store. Of course she works in the meat factory because she's a sawyer deep down inside. She doesn't know it. She's cutting up meat because I guess that's something she's going to have to already know how to do. Her best friend Nikki shows up and this conversation with Nikki is so weird and so awkward. Immediately I hate Nikki. Before I even have a good reason to hate her, I hate her just because she's a slut. The next scene, Heather is with her boyfriend, Trey Songs, and they're making out. Things are getting hot and heavy. And look, I'm all for seeing a white girl in a movie with a black boyfriend. It's awesome. <laughs> because, hey, I mean, that's kind of how I was created, right? So I'm all for this. But Trey Songs as an actor, no, no, no. He just, he doesn't cut it. He's not viable or believable. He was really only in this movie to help sell extra tickets, which sounds crazy. The idea that Trey Songs, the rapper, being in a horror movie would get people to want to see this film. But believe it or not, when this movie came out, Somebody did like a survey or they interviewed people after they came out of the film. Who knows if this was real or not, but I'm choosing to at least believe some of it. A lot of teenage girls or women in their 20s, like a lot of these women went to see this movie solely because of Trey Songs. They call it the Trey Songs movie. Oh, you want to see that film with Trey Songs? That's how they knew the movie. That's how they identified what this movie was. This is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for God's sakes. A movie that came out before this asshole was born. And I guess he's the reason why the movie made as much money as it did. So the group, her friends, her boyfriend, they decide to take a road trip. And they have a van. They drive down. On the way there, they meet Daryl. Daryl is a hitchhiker because, well, this is a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, so you got to have a hitchhiker, right? And as they drive there, they get to the house. The house looks pretty big, pretty nice. I'll admit I would be happy if I inherited this house. She has a letter at the house, but she chooses not to read it. You can tell that that's going to lead into something at some point. So they decide to stay there. But there's no food. They need food. So this is what they do. They tell Daryl, the hitchhiker, you know, the guy that they barely know, that they don't even really know. Let's be honest. You've known him for a couple of hours. They, they tell him to sit back, uh, watch the house, take care of the house. And we're all going to go to the store to get food. So, of course... Daryl starts stealing shit. <laughs> what the fuck, guys? It makes everybody else look dumb. It makes Heather look dumb. Because this is your new house. This is something like, shouldn't you, at least, as our main character, been smart enough to say, hey, maybe Daryl shouldn't be left behind. Maybe, I don't know, Nikki and her boyfriend should have stayed there. But of course not. Daryl ends up, he's stealing silverware and stealing as much stuff as he can fit in his bag. He goes down to the basement, and that's where he gets attacked by Leatherface, and, and so he's dead. He's gone. Heather, uh, while she's away, she meets the deputy, who's played by Scott Eastwood, which I always get surprised when I see Scott Eastwood show up in a film because... He's Clint Eastwood's son, so you think to yourself, oh, okay, well, he's going to have some prestige. He's going to be a great actor. He's fine. Fine at best. I mean, I think he's better nowadays. Yeah, a few years ago in this movie, he just he's so generic and so forgettable, so just one-note type guy. But he clearly has interest in Heather. Back at the house, they realize that the hitchhiker robbed them Granted, he's dead now, but if he if Leatherface wasn't there, 
he would have robbed them and actually left. So it's the same deal. They're in the same situation. They don't seem to care all that much, though, because they just begin to party and play pool and have fun, which, okay, fine. They don't cry over spilled milk. That's a good thing. Nikki's boyfriend, he decides to make dinner. And as he's doing that, he goes down to the basement. And what do you know? Leatherface is there again. He grabs him. He puts him on a hook. And then he chainsaws the guy in half. Like from his waist. And with the chainsaw, just cuts his, his, his body in half. And this would be a cool kill. Like I would be over the moon and singing the praises of this scene and of this kill. If they didn't already do this same exact kill in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake back in 2003. I've already seen this. I know it's hard, guys. I know it's hard to come up with brand new kills, brand new creative ways for Leatherface to kill people with his chainsaw. But when you've seen it before, it just it comes off regurgitated. It comes off like, oh yeah, this is like that scene from the other Texas Chainsaw movie. And so that kind of ruined this death. Nikki! You know Nikki. She is Heather's best friend. She has a boyfriend who is there too. She decides to seduce Trey Songs in the barn, kind of implying that they've been sleeping together on and off for a while now. And, okay, fine. Do I hate the fact that they have this side plot of these two cheating with each other? Yes, I hate it. Because it's dumb, it's unneeded, it's unnecessary, and it's super cliched. But I hate it even more because if you're going to have these, these type of characters, if you're going to have characters that would do something like this, why are they so dumb to do it at a house party where both of their significant others are at? Nikki's boyfriend is there. She doesn't know that he's dead. And, and Trey Songs knows that Heather is there and she's not that far off. There's no reason for them to think, oh yeah, we can just have sex in this barn and nobody's going to think anything. Nobody's going to look for us. No one's going to come out and possibly see us in the barn. It just, it makes them look so dumb and you can't wait for both of them to get killed. Then Heather finds the hitchhiker's body. She freaks out. She gets chased by Leatherface, which I guess you have to have, right? Heather is the only sort of normal, nice girl in the group, so she's going to run off and, and be chased. There's a sequence where she's running and she falls down the stairs, and I know that people trip and fall. I know it happens. I know it's human. But to do it in a horror movie... By this time, 2013, like, you've seen it. You've seen it so many times. You've seen it over and over again. And it's not the best thing to have your main character, who you're supposed to think is smart and capable and can handle herself, trip and fall so easily. She runs into the grave site and hides in, in a coffin. Why? Why? I know you're... you're you're, you're desperate. You're scared. You're doing everything you can to avoid Leatherface. Sure, this makes sense. But to put yourself in a coffin and hide there, it just it seems like the, the dumbest thing to put yourself in a claustrophobic situation in such a tight, confined space, and there's really nowhere for you to go. Like, if he finds you, you're fucked. And guess what? He does find her. He chainsaws uh, himself through the door, which narrowly touches her face, because of course you have to have that for the trailer moment. And I should probably talk about Alexandra Daddario as an actress and as a character. As an actress, I like her. I do. It helps that I've seen her in a lot of movies since this proving that she is a good actress and proving that this movie is not her fault this is the first time i noticed her ever so sure starting out in a horror movie it, it makes sense but she's a good actress she's very pretty so that helps as well but let's talk about the logic of this character because this was my biggest complaint 
the biggest complaint of most people after watching this. What is this timeline? How does this timeline make any sense? The beginning of the movie, it picks up right after the 1974 film, right? So you would think that the sequence where the town people come to the Sawyer house and burn it down and kill everyone is still 1974, right? Okay, so then you jump ahead years later where Heather, the baby that was found there, is grown up. But she looks to be in her early 20s. And so you think, well, okay, if that's the case, then this movie must be 1996, somewhere around there. But then, not only do you see when she's at the house originally, and she sees the gravesite of her grandmother... It says the year on the grave site. It says 2012. So you're telling me it's been close to 40 years since she was a baby? So Alexander Daddario is 40-something years old in this movie? <laughs> Bullshit! <laughs> I know that there are 40-something-year-old women who do look good, who do look younger, I'm not denying that. I'm not saying it's not impossible. But holy crap! It's impossible to think that this chick right here who we're following is 40-something. And then when you see her best friend, you see her boyfriend, they're not in their 40s either. Hell, this movie probably would have been more interesting if we had some 40-something-year-old people, some, some older actors, just to give it more weight and have it be something different instead of your usual teenage or early 20s type characters this could be this could have been the one chainsaw film where we followed adults this time around but no just no we have to have the movie not make any sense we have to make the director or the writer look horrible with their math <laughs> not only are they horrible movie makers filmmakers horror movie makers but they're horrible at adding years as well, this is laughable. I'm sorry if it feels like I'm harping on this one specific thing, but it's such a major thing. It's such a major fuck up. The age difference. I just, I can't get over it. Every time I see this, it blows my mind how not even a producer caught this major, major mistake. As uh, Heather is being chased, Trey Songs finally stops fucking the best friend. They come out of the barn. They see Leatherface, see that he's chasing her. So they decide to help distract him a little bit. Heather gets inside of the van, picks up her boyfriend and her friend. So Heather has no idea that they were just having sex with each other. It's not even like we get a scene or a shot where she suspects something and so maybe early on we know that she's smarter than she looks no she just has no idea leatherface cuts the tires of the van the van as it's trying to crash into the gate crashes completely and trey songs dies <laughs> so not only does trey songs who for some people was the number one reason why they came here He's betrayed as a dick, as a cheater, as an asshole boyfriend. His girlfriend never finds out that he was cheating on her. And then he dies in the most unscary, anticlimactic way ever. A car crash. <laughs> it's like we couldn't even have Leatherface when he stuck the chainsaw at the van instead of hitting the tire. Maybe cut him. Maybe it goes through the driver's seat and kills him no no he just he dies he hit his head whatever nikki is screaming her head off which is annoying as fuck another reason to hate her heather sacrifices herself to distract leatherface and runs off he chases her so that nikki can escape great because nikki is a real likable character leatherface chases heather to a carnival which is weird. I mean, I'm not against seeing Leatherface in a public environment, I guess. But doesn't that defeat the purpose of nobody knowing really about Leatherface or the family or that they exist? Having so many 
people and families around this area. Like, this just isn't the best spot to have him go to. Or if you're going to have him go to a public place, he should probably kill everyone. And he doesn't, really. Like, he's slicing people with the chainsaw left and right. Sure, sure, that's true. But it comes off silly. It comes off over the top. Uh, him in the carnival is not something I ever really wanted to see. Scott Eastwood, the deputy, just happens to be there patrolling, as you do. So he saves Heather. Leatherface leaves, and they bring her to the police department. Heather... While she's at the police department, she's telling them what happened and everything that's going on. Then they leave her alone. And they have this this file, this case of files, right next to her at the table. And so, well, I guess she's bored because nobody's there talking to her. She decides to go through the files. And what does she see? She sees that that the the town people killed this family burn the house down, everything that we already saw. And so she feels bad. She sympathizes. She actually feels bad for this family who are known cannibals who I'm sure in the same files are reported and record to have killed dozens, if not more people, cutting faces off, eating them it can't get more brutal than some of the shit they did but yet she feels bad that the town fought back and got revenge against them way to make heather even more unlikable so as that's going on the cops decide to send a police officer to the house and this is once again if if you want to say that that tombstone with the date was a typo or was it meant to be there or they realized it after the fact and if you want to argue that no maybe this does take place in the 90s this cop takes out a cell phone and uses facetime to show the other cops what he's looking at because once you see blood and there's a, there's a trail of blood going into the house let's not call for backup no no let's go into the house by ourselves, Oof. idiot, idiot, idiot. It's hard for me to feel bad for any of these people once they get killed, but you're showing me that they don't deserve my sympathy. They don't deserve my worry and anguish. They deserve everything. So as he's showing the basement and the dead bodies in there, which again is enough proof to get the fuck out of there and call for backup. He stays there. He opens a freezer. And Nikki! Remember Nikki? She was hiding in there. He opens it up and accidentally shoots her in the head. Aha! Honestly, I did laugh at this. I did think, wow, you dumb bitch. You were running away from Leatherface, or you were scared of Leatherface, so you ran back inside the house and hid in a freezer? Instead of running anywhere else to another house or anywhere to get help, you deserved it, Nikki. And good riddance. Leatherface shows up and kills the cop dead. We see him cut his face off and he makes a new mask, which I'll admit, I'm always a sucker for seeing Leatherface making a mask with someone's skin because it's creepy, it's brutal, and it just makes me think how probably fucked up ed gein was after that the mayor vows to end this because he saw the footage he saw the cops facetime video of him getting killed and leatherface killing more people so the mayor the guy at the beginning who was behind killing the family he wants to kill leatherface so he kidnaps heather in hopes that maybe this will lure him out. He brings Heather to the slaughterhouse. And he ties her up there. Leaves her for bait. Leatherface. He he finds the location because of the police radio. Of the cop he just killed. Here's the location. Leatherface ends up going there. And he finds Heather tied up. And she's screaming and she's upset and she's freaking out. And he has his chainsaw and he's 
toying with her, playing with her. He, he's an idiot, so he's not thinking about how this could be a trap or how this seemed too easy or why she's already tied up. But, you know, Leatherface is retarded, so I'm not going to get too mad about that. Right when he's about to kill her, right when he's about to do what he's been wanting to do this entire film, he sees a birthmark on her chest, which, first of all, how the hell did he catch this? This isn't that noticeable. This isn't something that you immediately see, or if you're going to kill somebody, you're going to notice the little opening of skin on their chest. But then again, it's Alexandra Daddario. She's hot. So I guess he did check her out. He sees this birthmark and he he realizes that it's it's a connection to the family, that Heather is connected to the family somehow, some way. So then he stops. The mayor, who was hiding, uh, comes out and attacks Leatherface. He beats the shit out of him. And then Heather, because she knows that she's related to the family, see... And even though he just was trying to kill her and almost killed her, she throws Leatherface the chainsaw and she yells, ready for this line, this horrible, horrible line that somebody sat down and wrote on a piece of paper for somebody else to read. She says, go get him, cuz. <laughs> what? Why? 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 Why would she say something so dumb like that? Why does she know that they're cousins? Like, how does she get that connection? Maybe the newspaper said uh, a baby missing and said the connection, but how would they know as well? So, yes, that alone is dumb. But it's also dumb that she would immediately side with this homicidal lunatic killer, go along with him, encourage him to kill this guy who, sure, he kidnapped her, but maybe his hatred for Leatherface and that family is justified, being as they killed so many people. But no, she just, she goes along with it. The same guy who, to her, she doesn't realize that her boyfriend was cheating on her. So to her, he's legitimately killed her whole group of friends and killed everyone that means a lot to her, that she loved and but no, we're just going to go along with it because it's a movie. Uh, the mayor gets killed in the meat grinder because why not? The sheriff, this black guy who's been sort of back and forth with the mayor and hasn't been so much behind uh, his crusade and wanting to kill the Sawyers. The, the sheriff sees this, sees Heather and Leatherface kill this guy and lets them walk, lets them leave. Why? Leatherface is still responsible for so many deaths and so many people in your town. Uh, come on, guys. Give me a character that makes sense. Give me a character that has some real logical thinking behind them. Why does this guy just give them a nod and let them go? Back at the house... <laughs> Heather finally reads that, le that letter that she had, and it tells her that she's the cousin of Leatherface, so now she knows for sure. Tells her to take care of him, that he needs special treatment, basically he's retarded, blah, 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 blah. So it's not like Heather did this, and she's thinking, well, crap, I mean, yeah, like I helped him kill a guy who kidnapped me and was bad and whatnot, but... It's not like there's a moment, and there should have been, there should have been a moment where Heather stops and realizes how fucked up this is, how crazy this is, how much she can't go along with abating a killer and taking care of him. So she uses his connection to her and that he's not going to kill her now. She uses that to maybe poison his food or to kill him when he's not realizing it, not looking, or to lock him in his basement room, lock him down there so he can never get out. That would be a satisfying ending. That would be an ending to where you think, all right, maybe she lost her mind a little bit. Maybe she had a temporary uh, moment of, of lapse judgment. I could forgive that. But no, she just ends up giving him food and saying, I'm going to take care of you now. 
because fuck the audience, right? This movie is trying to paint Leatherface and the Sawyer family as the victims. Are you fucking kidding me? You're going to watch that first movie, which that's the only movie according to this that's in canon. You're going to watch that first movie and you're going to see the Sawyer family. The fucked up crazy ass family, that dinner scene, the hitchhiker who was completely nuts and cutting himself and scaring the group, Leatherface who does what he does, you're going to see that family and think, you know what, they're the victims. <laughs> you know what, they're, there's more to their story and we can turn this around. Who wrote this shit? Why? Who thought that the audience wanted to sympathize with Leatherface and the Sawyers. Who thought that that was the right direction to go? Well, whoever you are, fuck you, dude. And what do you know? There's an after credit scene that I never saw in the theaters until now where Heather's adopted parents show up at the house because why not? I guess they got the address some way, somehow. And they show up there because they want money. And they want money because they're assholes, see? If they really were that bad of people, then why is Heather, why does she seem so well-adjusted at the beginning? Yeah, she goes evil at the end, but at the beginning, there's no sign that she's raised by a couple of degenerates. There's no parts of her personality that make it seem like these are her parents. But okay! And so these guys are assholes, so then Leatherface answers the door, and I guess presumably kills them. Because fuck people, right? Just because they're greedy assholes, they deserve to die. This movie has a great message! <laughs> I hate Texas Chainsaw, obviously. Uh, for a few years, it was my worst Texas Chainsaw Massacre film. As much as I don't like Part 2, as much as Part 4 is probably a worse made film, and maybe technically there's more... To complain about that fourth film. This movie pisses me off. This movie makes me angry. This movie makes me upset and frustrated. Every time I sit down and watch it. Or even think about it. I don't want to think about Texas Chainsaw anymore. I hate these writers. I hate this director. I hate that they killed the whole family at the beginning. And then tried to make us feel bad about it. I hate that they turned this main girl into a Sawyer killer because it doesn't make sense. You could have had it interesting to where she finds out she's related to the family and then still wants to fight them, though, because they're evil. <laughs> but no, just no. So much about this movie is bad and wrong. Let me know in the comments below if you've seen Texas Chainsaw. Oh, God, what do you think of it? Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Later. Kicking out the door with a Jason mask With a dead dumb machete But you motherfuckers know what's heavy Anytime you're ready